<laughs> well, good afternoon. Thanks for coming today. I'm Henry Cordonier, and this is Faith Stories number four. And the topic today is, I know you're on the edge of your seat waiting. <laughs> the topic today is love, Christian love. I think it's probably the most important talk of, of all seven that I'll be giving. First of all, let me do my advertisement here. Uh, I've got two books, My Gospel and More Gospel that I've written, and they're available on Amazon, but they're also available upstairs in the gift shop at Do Good Restaurant. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Because of your love, we exist. And because of your love, we will exist forever in your embrace. We thank you so much. Glory be to the Father, and, and to, to the, the Son, and, and to the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. All right. Well, wonderful. Great to have you here. And uh, I'll be telling some stories about love. So let's start with the definition of love. I actually went to Google and to the dictionary online, and I was really disappointed. If you type in love, you know, definition, it gave four or five definitions, and none of them are even remotely close as to what we would call Christian love. It was all a, a deep feeling of affection, uh, sexuality. It was all like romantic. But we know that love, I'll give you the definition that I use. Always seeking the best interest of the other person. Love seeks the best interest of the other person. Now, a lot of times that means you're going to have to be self-sacrificing. And that's Christian love. Jesus teaches us uh, unconditional love, as we say. And that's that's not easy to do, is it? I'm sure you all have stories in your own life that are going to be very familiar, very similar to mine. And um, uh, it, it can be very painful to love people. It can be wonderful, too. So, um, well, the first one here I've got, years ago at the uh, Holy Angels prayer meeting, there was a young girl uh, named Rhonda Ryer, and she was dying of cancer. And Father O'Connor was the parish priest there at Holy Angels, and he prayed for her a lot and took care of her a lot. And Actually, there developed a, a real bond between him and this young girl. Do you guys remember how old she was? Maybe 12? About 12. Something like that. And uh, just so sad, a young girl dying of cancer, and she had so much pain. And, and he would often ask the, the prayer group to pray for her, and we did. We were praying for a healing and everything, but eventually she died of it. But uh, in, the, in the last days there, she had a lot of pain. And one evening at the prayer group, we were praying that she would have uh, no pain that night. And my wife, Anne, God bless her, uh, Anne was such a champ. Um, she, she herself prayed to the Lord and she said, Lord, uh, let me take her pain tonight. So she'll have one night without pain. 
we got home from prayer meeting uh, probably around 10, 10.30 and, and uh, went to bed and she had an attack of bursitis in her shoulder that she had never had before. And it was horrible. She laid there crying most of the night. It hurt so bad. And then the next day, we talked to uh, people and found out that Rhonda had had a, the first night in months that she slept through the night and she didn't have any pain. That, that's love. That's love. I mean, uh, of course, that's what our Lord did for us. He took the death penalty. He suffered the pain for us. So, uh, true love is self-sacrificing. It can be a, a one-time event. Or it can be an event that, um, that goes on and on. Uh, I'm reminded of a, of a story <laughs> that goes with that. Sometimes my stories are not all in my notes. I, I get reminded of things as I, as I tell. And there was an older lady. And I'd say she was about 80 and she was talking to me she was married as a young woman and they had five or six i can't recall they had five or six kids and um her husband uh started an affair with another woman committing adultery with her and then just ran off with her didn't even bother to divorce her. I mean, he just left. He just left. And there she was with those five kids. And she worked odd jobs. She cleaned houses and such. And she made her way through life. I don't think he ever paid her any any child support or anything. He just abandoned her. And, you know, that would be very, very painful, wouldn't it? I mean, just such a stab in your heart. And yet, 60 years later, when she was talking to me, she said, I am so happy that I have kept my vow. She said, I know it won't be too much longer. I'm getting old. The Lord will call me home. And I'll be able to say, mm -hmm. I kept my vows. And she had been praying for her husband all those years that God would save his soul, that he would repent. But she said, I kept my vows. He didn't, but I did. And she found really a lot of happiness in that. She was smiling as big as can be when she told me that. Man, long suffering. That's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, long suffering. And sometimes we suffer for years and decades. Some people, their whole life is suffering. And to keep faith in God and to love that other person, not to become bitter, not to become resentful, this, this is love. This is true love. So... I think she's a great example of true love. Well, my brother 
got married uh, right out of high school and the girl he married had was a year younger and she was a senior in high school and mm -hmm. this was back in the early 70s late 60s mm -hmm. and uh, they had a baby right away and then another one and seven years later she divorced him and that was really kind of odd he worked really hard he had built a home for them a brand new house and he worked at uh, general motors in dayton and so he's building in the evening and he's working during the day and maybe he worked too much i don't know but they were young and immature and it didn't work out and um he had taken two days and gone fishing up at lake erie when he got home, he stopped at uh, he stopped at our house. We lived a mile away from where he was building that house, and we asked him how the fishing went. He told us about the fishing, and and Dad happened to be reading the Sydney Daily News, and he happened to see in the paper where they put divorces, and it had Leo's name there. And he said, Leo, what's this in the paper about you having a divorce? And he said, what? what? I don't know anything about that. And he looked at it and like, whoa, what's that about? Mm -hmm. So he found out he was getting divorced by reading it in the paper. <laughs> when he got to his home on the front door, there was a note that said, go to the post office and pick up your mail. He went to the post office, picked up the mail, and there he got the official letter that he was being divorced. Well, we tried to reconcile things um, with uh, Carrie, and and um, it uh, it just didn't work. And um, sadly, I mean, my brother was devastated. I mean, he was just it just hit him out of the blue just totally devastated well when reconciliation efforts i know dad and i tried to to help a little bit but nothing i i i was a younger guy and i drove over to talk to her and it just wasn't gonna work and um dad wrote a letter he had me write it. Dad never wanted to write it. He, he had me write a letter for him to Carrie saying, you know, when you married into our family, I accepted you as my daughter. And no matter what happens, you're still my daughter. And if you ever need anything, don't hesitate to, to call for help. About two years later, mm -hmm. she calls my dad. She had been having health problems and she was off of work and she had two little girls and she was having money troubles because she was off work and the paycheck wasn't coming in and she was by herself and, and uh, so she was short on money. And so she called up my dad and said, that's the, you know, I'm, I'm off work. I got some health troubles here for a while. I, I could use some money. Dad, she was living up in Lima and dad told me, uh, Henry, let's go see her. So we drove up to Lima and, and I, dad gave her uh, a certain amount of money, you know, uh, and then he signed a blank check. and he left it with her. He said, if that amount of money is not enough, he said, write yourself for some more. Mm -hmm. Now this is to the woman who devastated your son, who divorced him, walked away from him, and wasn't coming back. 
That's unconditional love, isn't it? That's amazing. And she used that second check. And dad didn't have the money. He had to go to the bank to borrow the money to give to her. That's love. That's what love is. When Jesus spoke about love, he would say, what credit is there if you <laughs> greet those who greet you? You know, what credit is there if you do good to those who do good to you? If, if you invite someone over for supper and they invite you back, he said, what good is that? He said, anybody does that. It's when we love people, as dad used to say, when you're washing somebody's feet and they keep kicking you in the face. <laughs> and I imagine in your lifetime, You've probably had some of that. Anne's mother was Mary. And when she was in her 60s, we're not sure exactly what happened. But she just wasn't thinking correctly. She had some really weird ideas, and <coughs> she had been married to uh, uh, Dick for 32 years, and she just got, we think maybe she had thyroid troubles, because she just wasn't, she wasn't thinking straight. And uh, she was still physically going to her job and everything, she worked at Stoley's, and but she said that grandpa was having an affair or something. And I mean, it was nuts. She said, that woman was in my house right there's the, the cigarette butts in the ashtray. I said, mom, that's your cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And and we 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 just couldn't get anything across to her. And and she became completely unreasonable. And she divorced him after 32 years. I mean, she called the sheriff and said, get that man out of the house. And, and he was heartbroken and he didn't do a thing wrong. And, um, and she wanted um, her two daughters to agree with her that grandpa was a bad guy. And my daughter was, and her sister, were never going to do that. And the, um, the upshot was she just became very um, bitter and resentful. And she wouldn't talk, she didn't talk to Anne for five years. Uh, Katie was five years old. And uh, after Katie, we had Luke. I don't know if Maggie was born yet or not. She had never even seen these, these grandkids and she worked one mile down the road. And didn't give Ann her phone number even. We didn't even have her phone number. For like five years. And she just like, you're dead to me. Wouldn't talk to him, have nothing to do with him. And and later when she died of cancer, um, uh, the first line of her will said, my two daughters will not get one penny. <laughs> it's like the first thing she said, you know, is I hate my two daughters. <laughs> so she had a really bad attitude for about five years and then she got sick. She had a little stroke and she needed help. Well, she calls us up and we helped her as if she was the nicest mom you'd ever had. 
That's unconditional love. That's what we're supposed to do. And we did. She was up in Jackson Center and I'd drive up there and take her to her doctor visit and, you know, take her back home and drive back to Rushi. I mean, we were up to Jackson Center all the time from Rushi. And we did that for a couple of years, taking care of her and, and she, she warmed up a little bit, but not a whole lot. But she needed our help and we gave her our help. And then um, we found out on uh, one Saturday morning she fell and she couldn't get up on the couch and she called and we went up there and we took her to the hospital to check her out. Well, they found that she was full of cancer and she died the next Saturday morning. She was really full of cancer. And, uh, but thankfully, you know, we, I got her a priest at the hospital. And when she got home on Wednesday of that week, uh, she had, she liked a priest from, um, Russell's point. So I called him. He said, I'll come right over. So he came and gave her the last rites and, and the anointing of the sick and everything. And, and then she went into a coma the next day and died the next day. So um, hopefully everything had a good end. But uh, that's love. Maybe you have family members that haven't always treated you right. I find that that happens a lot. <laughs> that in families, there are some really hard feelings. I worked with a guy once and he had good memories of going rabbit hunting with his dad. Well, that is a good thing. I have good memories of doing that with my dad too. And when his dad uh, died, he told his brother, he said, I'm going to go to the house and, and get uh, dad's shotgun. He said, I want to keep that, you know, as a keepsake. And his brother said, no, you're not. He said, I already went to my dad's house. He said, I, I already went there and I got it. It's in my gun safe and you're never going to get it. And the guy told me, he said, I'm so mad. He, he said, that's been 20 years ago. And he said, I've never said a word to my brother since. Over a stupid shotgun. He had stopped talking to his brother. His brother had stopped talking to him over a stupid gun for 20 years. And I, to, to my knowledge, they never reconciled. Now, that's the opposite of love. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus wants us to do. And I just think you lost your brother over a gun. There wasn't, I don't know, there just seems to me there wasn't that great a love between the two brothers. I mean, if you really loved your brother, would you, would you give up a relationship for just a material item? I've heard stories I know up in this part of the world, farms are a big deal. And I've heard stories where some people don't talk to each other anymore because somebody bought a farm or didn't let them buy a farm or cheated them out of a farm. My dad told a story about uh, a married couple that had a farm and they had some adult children. and. And you talk about terrible. They 
thought, I forget which way it went. They thought mom was going to die, so they put all the, so they put everything in dad's name. And then suddenly, dad died unexpectedly and mom lived. Mm -hmm. And so, since it was all in his name and the will said it went to the kids, the kids put mom in the poor house and they took the farm. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Yeah, awful. That you sell out your own mother? Legally, she doesn't have a thing. We put her in the poor house and we take the farm. Man, that is so the opposite of love. So to understand love, we've got to see the opposite of it sometimes too. Well, let's go back to a nicer story. <laughs> Well, I was working at s &H Products, which is a sheltered workshop in Sydney, Ohio for the developmentally disabled and the mentally retarded. And I was on the original crew of that shop. We started in 1977. And um, there were adults who came in for a workshop setting every day they came on a bus and uh, they worked you know from like nine to three and then the bus took them home it's a wonderful program and most counties now have one and that's a really good thing I look back over my life and I think one of the one of the best things that happened in my life Time is that we treat uh, handicapped people better than we did the, the mentally uh, handicapped uh, way way better than what we used to we can still do better but we've improved um, where was I oh we had a lady out there uh, well one day uh, a young man 30, he shows up uh, at the door and uh, I greet him and he's got a little girl about three or four years old next to him. Hi, how are you? And he said, uh, is uh, Sally here? And I said, yes. He said, can we see her? Uh, I said, well, who are you? And he said, uh, I'm her son and this is her granddaughter. And I about fell over because Sally had almost zero mind. And she was in a wheelchair and she was extremely frail. I never saw anybody move a wheelchair so slowly. <laughs> I mean, It's ridiculous. <laughs> it would take her literally a minute to go from here to that wall, moving her wheelchair so slowly. Oh my goodness. But she was a happy person and I used to laugh with her every day and she could only say, yeah, no, that was the only vocabulary she had. She couldn't walk. She couldn't go to the bathroom. She couldn't, I mean, we had to take care of her completely. And when I heard this is her son and her granddaughter, I thought, what? How is that possible? And I basically said, how is that possible? <laughs> and he said, oh, he said, you know, Sally wasn't always like this. She, she was married and, and had a family and she was in a car accident. And a car accident had left her in that condition. And she had been out there for some years. I was there four years. 
And this was the first contact by anybody. And so I asked the kid, I said, well, where's your dad? I said, he's, I've never heard of him. I've never, he's never come out here. We, oh, he said, a few months after the car accident, when Sally was left like this, uh, he divorced her. And he's, he's not around anymore. Guess he didn't mean those vows when you say for better or worse in sickness and in health. Hey, at the moment of her life, when she needed him the most, he left because it was hard. Now, there was another man who worked at SNH. He was the uh, custodian. Great big guy. Real big. And his nickname was Tiny. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed that Tiny took the longest lunch hours. And I said, Tiny, what gives? You leave about 11 and you come back about 1. I said, what's up with this lunch hour? Oh, he said, I only live less than a mile from here. He said, I live right on the south side of Sydney. And he said, my wife uh, from a car accident has been paralyzed. And she's in a wheelchair. Her arms and stuff moved, but she was paralyzed from the waist down. And he said, I always take a job where I'm close by where she is, where we live. That way I can take care of her. He said, before I come to work, I get her up, get her to the bathroom, have breakfast, get her situated. And then I go to work for four hours. He said, then at lunch, I go home, I make lunch for us, I get her fed, get her to the bathroom, get her situated, and then I come back to work. He said, when work's done, I go home, I make supper, I get her to the bathroom and get her situated. He said, well, maybe we'll go for a drive in the evening or maybe we'll watch TV or something. And, and um, That's what he did every day. Right there, in my workplace, I had the greatest example of love that you'd ever want to see. And a terrible example of not loving. Wouldn't the world be such a better place if we were all like Tiny? You know? Uh, it's just so amazing. He was an amazing person. And you would never know it. I would have I didn't know it till I finally, you know, asked him one day why he took such <laughs> long lunch hours. And um but he meant his vows. She wasn't that way when they got married. And a terrible accident happened and, and he just kept loving her. And that's, when we think of love, we think of marriage, don't we? I mean, marriage is all about love. But that's the kind of love that makes marriage so wonderful. That at that moment when you need them, when you're sick, when you're suffering, when you're unemployed, when, I mean, when bad things happen, that's when your spouse really, really needs you. Heck, anybody will be your buddy when things are going good. But when they're, but the, when they're really tough, that's when your spouse really needs you. And again, I mean, I, I'm telling stories from my own life and from people I know. 
Um, being married to Anne for 42 years was was so wonderful because not once, not once did it ever cross my mind that if that that she would ever leave me if it got tough. I had a, a heart attack. I almost died in 1993, four, somewhere uh, in there. I should know that. Uh, I just about died. <laughs> Came real close. Came real close. And, um, and I thought, man, you know, it was a Friday. It was first Friday. I'd been to Mass that morning. I'd gone to confession Thursday evening, the night before. Had my halo all shined up. <laughs> you know, all shined up and ready to go. And I was just about, and then they called the priest at the hospital. And, you know, and I'm laying there having a heart attack. And, and, and the priest comes and gives me the last rites and gives me the apostolic pardon. I mean... I, I, I got the door to heaven halfway open. <laughs> but, but I didn't get a go. You know, I knew if I had a stroke and I was paralyzed, and was going to take care of me. I, that's, that's, that's one of, if not maybe the greatest thing about being married is you have this person who loves you unconditionally and they are there with you, helping you through whatever happens. It is an awesome institution. Marriage is a fantastic thing. And sadly, it's under attack in our modern world. And sadly, half of marriages end in divorce in our, in our country today. That is so sad as much as we possibly can we need to teach our children and our grandchildren what real christian marriage is because that's like the one of the greatest gifts you could ever have this one I'll probably have to cry through this one <laughs> I've been holding it together pretty good so far <laughs> anytime I talk about Ann we're going to be on edge uh, when I first took that job at s &H, the sheltered workshop for the handicapped we had severely handicapped people there and Many of them couldn't talk, uh, couldn't walk, couldn't take care of their own bathroom needs. We were constantly doing very, very basic things, things that you would do for an infant. And, um, but that's wonderful. Our society should help care for people who cannot care for themselves. But I took this job and I had never worked with anybody like that. I had never lived with anybody like that. And the first week or two, I didn't know if this job was gonna work out for me. There was a woman, middle age. She had a lot of handicaps. Um, Susie, I'll call her. And Susie was small, very short, maybe four and a half feet tall, weighed maybe 80 pounds, real thin. I'm thinking she's 45 years old, something like that. And her face was completely contorted. Her teeth were horrendous. Uh, she had one hip that was way higher than the other one. She walked with the most horrible limp, but she could walk. She had a terrible hump 
on her back like scoliosis or something. She was just a hot mess. That's all there's to it. And oh, and when she ate her food, but she was happy and smiling. And every day she came off the bus, she'd come up to limp up to me and hi, Henry. And she would hug me. And I'm going to say something terrible. It's terrible. But I was very uncomfortable with that. And in my mind, it's like, get this freak off of me. Now that's awful. But that's, that was just my reaction. I wasn't used to any of this. Okay, I had had my conversion, and I loved Jesus very much, and I was going to Mass every morning. Holy Angels had an early Mass so I could go to work. I went to Mass every morning, received Jesus and Holy Communion every morning. Very, you know, uh, important to me. And I was reading a book one evening, Something Beautiful for God by Malcolm Muggeridge. Uh, it was a book about Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Reading books is a really good thing to do. <laughs> um, and as I read the book that evening, it said, it, it told the story of uh, Mother Teresa would tell her nuns, you see how the priest holds the host so respectfully, with so much reverence, and he elevates the host, and then he lays it down gently, and he shows so much uh, love and respect and reverence for the host, because it's the body of Christ. He said, today, you sisters will go into the streets of Calcutta and you will pick up dead people and dying people. And maybe they have excrement on them and worms eating their open sores and they stink. And she said, they are the body of Christ too. And you pick them up with reverence, with respect, and bring them to our house for the dying. And, and you take care of them with all the love you can because that's Jesus. Wow, I closed the book. That made sense to me because I went to Mass every day and I believe that Jesus is there in the Holy Eucharist. And I would always treat it with great respect. And then I prayed. And the Lord just changed me in that evening. Somehow he just changed me. And I saw Sandra, uh, excuse me. Well, that was her real name. <laughs> I saw her as Jesus the next day. And when she came limping in, I, am, I embraced her and loved her. And I have never for a moment felt a repulsion or anything. Somebody who's handicapped, somebody who's, who's mentally not there, somebody who's physically not there, somebody who most of the world, who I would have said is repulsive. No, not anymore. They're Jesus. They're the body of Christ. It's just a wonderful miracle in my heart. And it's, it's, it's the miracle of God. 
He helps us to love people. Scripture says the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. And that's what he did to me. And I worked there then for four years. And I loved those people so much. And I cried like a baby when I left. And um, so that was, a, that was a real transformation in my heart. the thought comes to me, is there someone in your life who's difficult to love? Maybe this evening you should pray and ask God to pour out his love into your heart so that you can love that person as you love Jesus. It worked for me. <laughs> Anne knew a woman who was a wreck. She was obese extremely. Didn't have a job didn't have a husband anymore, had a child, and she was pro-life. And Anne interacted with this woman quite often. And Anne is just such a loving person. Way better than me. I knew this person too, and I just kind of, I'm always like, let's go, let's get life together, kid. <laughs> and Anne would just, she was, Anne's greatest attribute was her humility. She was, she was always, she never thought she was any better than the next person. And uh, that old saying, if it weren't for the grace of God, there go I, you know. You see someone who's really struggling in life and it wasn't for God's grace, that would be you. And she knew that and she believed that. And when she was younger, she had struggled so much. And so she was willing to accept anybody and, and love them. She didn't want to leave them. A lot of times people say, well, God accepts you as you are. That's true, but he doesn't want to leave you as you are. He wants to love you and me into wholeness. And wherever we find a person, we don't want to leave them where they are. We want our love to help to transform them to be all that God wants them to be. Now, a lot of people don't want to even start that process. They don't want to accept you as you are. They just, I don't see you. The poor and the homeless, they're invisible. People don't see them. They don't want to see them. And that person who's needy and who is um, handicapped in one of a thousand different ways, it's going to cost me, and I don't want to pay the price, so I just don't look at them. I ignore them. That's what most people do with most people who have a problem. And uh, just gave this woman time. And over about six years, it really changed her. I mean, she was so needy and wanting love, she even became a lesbian for a while. 
And Anne would say, well, I'm going out to lunch with her. She came back and said, well, she brought her lesbian partner. And Anne would never fudge the rules. And this other woman kind of got in her face. Well, I guess you don't think this is the right thing. And Anne says, I love you, but I will never agree that what you're doing is right. It's wrong. But you couldn't hate Anne because she was just so sweet about it. <laughs> Yeah, what you're doing is really bad. <laughs> she was just so good about it. Well, long story short, it took it took about six years, but the woman ended up losing about 125 pounds. She got a job. She actually got a car. She actually got her own apartment to live in. She stopped being a lesbian. And... and um, She's going to church. What can I say? Love is, love is very powerful. Love changes people. from the inside out. And that's the only change that ever really happens. The only change that ever really counts is the change that happens from the inside. In our world, we, we try to change other people. Parents try to change their kids. One spouse tries to change the other spouse. And you can talk to them and you can reason with them and you can yell at them and you can spank them. <laughs> and as a society, we arrest them and we put them in jail and, and we do all kinds of things and we try to change people. <sighs> and, our, and our efforts often fall very short, don't they? Because the real change happens from the inside. It's the power of the Holy Spirit working inside. I have a friend who calls it interior decorating. God changes us from the inside out. The little boy, he was running around the classroom in the first grade and the teacher said, sit down, Johnny. And he didn't want to, he was still moving around. <laughs> sit down in your seat. And finally she grabs him and she pushes him down in the chair. And she said, I said, sit down. And he said, on the inside, I'm still standing up. <laughs> he wasn't changed. Real change happens on the inside. And then that shows on the outside. This is why in our life, we have to pray. We have to take time to think. We have to let the Lord in on the inside. And, we, and that's where our will is. We have to open up our will and say, okay, Lord, you have my permission. Please change me. which is kind of scary to do, but it's worth it.
some people what time do we start 1 30 oh I'm down to just a few minutes we'll do the best we can some people don't think they can be loved when I got the idea to start the Women's Center in Sydney back in 1983, and I'll be talking more about that next week. Next week is pro-life stories. And I didn't, I had an idea, but I didn't know how to do it. And then I heard that there was a crisis pregnancy center in Cincinnati. So I drove down there and spend a day down there watching and learning and making connections. And there was a lady down there, um, I'll say her name because I hope she's in heaven or I don't know if she's even dead yet, but Jackie Herman, I think she had 13 kids and she was the greatest pro-lifer you ever wanted to meet. I mean, what a dynamo of pro-life activity. It's just one of the great heroes of our, of our day. And then she came up and helped did training for the original volunteers for our center in Sydney. I put out the word, we had 19 women who showed up and we had training at our house in our living room and Jackie Herman came up from Cincinnati to teach us what to do and how to do it. But that day when I was down there, a woman came in, she was a prostitute. She had had nine abortions When the counselor spoke with her and said, Jesus loves you, she disdainfully laughed at that. And she said, Jesus doesn't love me. God could never love me. She had so much pain, so much hurt, so much guilt, God could not love me. That's, that's the ultimate lie of the devil. Sometimes in your life, in your mind, in your thinking, there are thoughts that condemn you. Those come from the evil one. In the Bible, the evil one is called the accuser of the brethren. You're a prostitute. You're a murderer. You're evil. Those kind of thoughts come from the evil one himself. He wants to destroy that concept that God loves us. And eventually, he wants you to kill yourself because that is the end of that road. When you say, I'm no good, my life is worthless, it is very painful here, tomorrow's gonna to be worse than today, I'm gonna to call it quits. And that's exactly what the evil one wants to do. And we were there to tell her and to show her and to help her come to know that Jesus does love you. Jesus loved that woman as much as he loved his mother, Mary. Do you believe that? It's true. God is perfect in every way. And his love is perfect. And he loves that woman. And he loves every human being. And he does accept us where we are, but he wants to love us into wholeness. 
He wants to love us into eternal life. He wants to love us into a condition where we become a channel of his love and love others. So I would ask you to let him love you. Let him open up your, your mind, your heart, pray, accept his love, reject the lies of the evil one. The Holy Spirit is always encouraging us. In the scripture, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. That's a Greek word. You know what it meant back in the day? It meant your defense attorney. The guy sitting next to you when you're on trial. The devil's the accuser. You committed the crime. The Holy Spirit is our advocate, our paraclete, our consoler. He's our defense attorney. He's defending us. He's always consoling us. The Lord loves you. Jesus died for your sins. Tomorrow will be better. You can do better. God's grace is with you. The Holy Spirit is constantly helping us, consoling us, advocating for us. <clears throat> Judge, have mercy on my client. So reject that, those, those thoughts that condemn and don't be a condemner. The woman was totally guilty of adultery. They caught her in the act. Jesus said, I do not condemn you. We never condemn the person, but go and sin no more. We never change the rules. God gave us his wisdom because it's the best for us. So we always follow exactly what Jesus taught. We love the sinner, but we hate the sin, and we should hate sin. It's terrible for all of us. But we got to love that sinner. That's not always the easiest thing to do. That's why you have to have God's grace, and you get God's grace by asking for it. Lord, make me a channel of your peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, make us a channel of your peace, a channel of your love to everyone we meet. As we carry your love to others, we ourselves will be filled with love, and your love will heal us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.